Hallelujah. We are saved today. If you have your Bible with, with you this morning, turn with me to Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter. Ezekiel 22. We talk a lot around here about praying for people and how important prayer is and how that we need to pray for those. I've even made the statement before that some people, you may be the only person that's praying for them. Amen? And I think as we see the end draw closer, Brother Bruce, I think that might even be more truthful because less and less people are praying. Amen? Amen? Amen. But we're going to look this morning and see just how important it is how dire the need is that we pray for our nation, for our family, for the lost. We find here in the book of Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter, the 23rd verse, the Lord is getting ready to speak to a people through the prophet that had lost their way and that were living ungodly and unlawful. And some of the things we're going to read here in the next few verses might even remind you of the nation that we live in today. Ezekiel 22 and 23. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Verse 26. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. You see any resemblance this morning to the nation that we live in? They have put no difference between the holy and the profane, and this applies to the church as well. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Let me back up here for a minute. I'm going to read verse 26 again because I think I skipped something. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. I skipped that while ago. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. He has become a byword to them and a curse word. You can see the same in our nation today. Amen. Amen. Her princes, verse 27, in the midst thereof are like wolves. Now princes would be a type and a form of government. Amen. Amen. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. Oh, if I don't describe most of our government today, I don't know what does. Amen? Dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, speaking, van seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, and the Lord hath not spoken. In other words, giving false words from God, saying, This is what God has said, yet God had not said it. Verse 29, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Now just for a moment, I want to skip verse 30. If we went directly from verse 29, which reads, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Verse 31 says this, Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them 
with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. So you could go from verse 29 to verse 31 and you could see how all that fits together. Verse 30 could have been completely left out. Oh, but thank God it wasn't. Amen? Hallelujah? Thank God He didn't leave out verse 30. Why, preacher? Because verse 30 says this, And I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Verse 30 is there for a reason this morning. And this touched my spirit all the way down to the core of my being. And I prayed as, as I prayed over this message, I prayed, Lord, let me express to them the way that you've shown it to me. And I doubt that I'll do it. I'll do a pitiful job of it, I'm sure. But we see how very easily the Lord could have went from verse 29 to verse 31 and destroyed them and brought His judgment upon them. But in verse 30, because of His mercy, Brother Jim, because God would rather have mercy than judgment, before He poured out His wrath, He stopped and He looked to see if He could find somebody somewhere that was standing in the gap for the land. Somebody somewhere that was seeking the face of God. Somebody somewhere that was crying out from an altar, crying out to God to have mercy on this people. Sadly, in this situation, He found none, which is what brings verse 31. His judgment. I'm going somewhere this morning, church. Don't let me lose you. Had He have found someone in verse 30, Sister Sharon, had he have found somebody seeking his face? Had he have found somebody saying, Oh God, forgive this land. Have mercy on these people. Give them a space to repent. Had he have found that? Verse 31 would have been altogether different. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. God would so much rather this morning have mercy than judgment. He goes out of his way, Brother John. To have mercy before His judgment comes. He will deal with the heart of man long past the time that we would have given up. Amen? Think about yourself this morning and the life that you've lived at the place you came from. You probably would have gave up on yourself long before now, but God didn't. Amen? Amen. Amen. We would have written America off long before now, but there's still a chance but that chance is only if God can find a remnant, if He can find somebody seeking His face on behalf of the nation. Amen. We have lost loved ones today that their only hope is if you stand in the gap and seek the face of a living God and ask Him to have mercy on their souls. This people here were in a terrible shape. If you look at all of the terrible atrocities that they had done, if it had been up to us, we probably would have skipped right down to 31 and cut them off. But before God poured out His judgment, Mama, He sought for somebody. Somebody that was praying. Somebody that was sick. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody that was seeking the face of God on behalf of the land. That's what He said. He said, I looked for someone that was seeking me, that was standing in the gap on behalf of the land, but sadly here in this place He found none. And because He found none, His judgment came. Amen. Because He found none, His judgment was poured out. You see, before judgment, before cutting them off, before pouring out His wrath, Hallelujah. He sought for someone. He sought for someone that was standing in the gap. You see, before He pours out His wrath, He looks. His mercy. His mercy looks. His mercy seeks for someone. For a remnant this morning. That is crying out to God, have mercy on America. 
For someone standing in the gap that is crying out for their family, have mercy on my family. Give them a space to repent. Don't cut them off and let them go to hell. His mercy seeks and His mercy listens for the voice of the remnant that is crying out to Him on behalf of the land. Here in the book of Ezekiel, in this particular spot, He found none, so He poured out His judgment. The Lord was looking. The Lord was looking. The Lord was listening for someone who was interceding, that was standing in the gap, standing between His judgment and the land. Standing between His judgment and the people. He longs so much more today. I, if, if you don't remember anything else that I preached this morning, remember this, He longs so much more today to have mercy than judgment. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Sadly, his response in this situation was that he found none. And because of that, he poured out his judgment. And that's what happens when the voice of the remnant is silent. That is what happens when there is no voice in the land that is heard repenting and pleading and crying out to God. Do you know how many times God's servants, even though they were not involved in the sin that was going on, would hit their knees in sackcloth and ashes and say, God, forgive us. Amen. Even including their self, even though they weren't the ones that was involved in the idolatry, they would hit their knees and intercede on behalf of a land that had become consumed with idolatry. America has become consumed with idolatry. The church today has become consumed with idolatry. Amen. And God looks and He listens. He looks for someone standing in the gap. He listens for the voice of the remnant crying out to Him for mercy. Crying out to Him for mercy. And here He found none. You see, without the remnant standing in the gap, judgment is sure. And we see in this passage of Scripture in Ezekiel that that's the truth. We see what happens whenever the voice of the remnant is not heard. We see what happens when there's nobody concerned enough to pray. We see what happens whenever there's no one standing in the gap. But let's look this morning at a couple of examples where someone did stand in the gap. Turn with me this morning to Genesis, the 18th chapter. Let's look at Abraham and Lot. And we all know the story. We've been taught this from the time that we were in Sunday school. Abraham and Lot, their herdsmen couldn't get along. They were fighting amongst themselves, so they had to part ways. And Abraham said, Lot, I'll give you the choice. You go to the south, and I'll go the opposite direction. You go to the west, I'll go the opposite direction. You go down, I'll go up. Whatever the case. And Lot looks toward the plains of Sodom, and it looks green like Egypt, so he decides to go to Sodom. He pitches his tent towards Sodom and it's not too long before, according to the Bible. His righteous soul is vexed by the conversation of the people of the city. Instead of him having an influence on them, they had influence on him. Think about that the next time you think, well, they're my friends. They drink, they cuss, they smoke. No, but I'll, 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 I'll get involved with them and I'll be a positive influence on them. Yeah, if you ain't careful before too long, you'll be sitting right there with them drinking and cussing and smoking your pot. Because that's exactly what happened to Lot. He had no positive influence on them, but they had influence on him. Whenever the two angels would go down there, and the perverts of the city would come to his house and say, bring those men out so that we can know them. They wanted to commit a homosexual act with them. You know what Lot did? He said, oh, no, no, please don't. Take my daughters. That's what kind of bad shape Lot was in. He offered his daughters to a bunch of perverts. So we know, and if, while he's down there, we don't find any record of him seeking God and offering sacrifice and building altars and being a positive influence. No, we find that he's in a terrible shape and we find that God is getting ready to pour out His judgment 
to pour out His judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's read a little bit. I'm in Genesis 18 and 20. And the Lord said, Because of the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, think about that this morning. Think about America's grievous sin and how it must cry in the ears of the Lord. Because of this, He said, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now we see here that the Lord is sending these angels to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord already knew how bad things were down there. But because He's a just God. Because He's a righteous God. He said, I'll see what's going on. And I'm going to pour out my judgment upon them. And Abraham knew this. Abraham knew that God is a holy God and a righteous God. You know what else Abraham knew? He knew how wicked and evil Sodom and Gomorrah was. You know what else Abraham knew? He knew that some of his family was down there. You know what else he knew? He knew that if God poured out His judgment upon them, and I can't prove this by Scripture, but possibly word had got back to Abraham that Lot wasn't doing too good spiritually. And he's afraid that Lot is going to get destroyed with the rest of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he stands here before the Lord. Listen to what it says. I don't know if I want to read all of this or not, but you'll get the gist of it. It says, Abraham drew near. I'm in verse 23. Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom, Fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the plain for their sakes. And Abraham continues along this line of prayer, and he takes it from 50 to 40, and from 40 to 30, and from 30 to 20, from 20 to 10. And each time the Lord gives him the same answer. And each time we see here that Abraham is standing there pleading with God, God knows who he's talking about, God knows who he's praying about. He's praying on behalf of Lot. I don't know if Abraham knew anybody else down there other than Lot and his family. And he's afraid Lot's fixing to be destroyed. And apparently he don't think Lot's praying for himself. So he goes out on the hillside and stands before God and intercedes for Lot. And this is what he's praying is will you spare the city for the sake of my family? Will you spare my family when your judgment is poured out? So he goes along these lines and he prays. Jump over to verse to chapter 19. We know what happens. While you're turning to chapter 19 and verse 27, we know that the angels grab Lot and his family by their hands and leads them out of the city before the fire falls, before the judgment falls. Lot's wife, she turns around and she looks back, turns into a pillar of salt. But Lot and his daughters escape. And verse 19 and 27 is pretty clear as why. Listen, Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. He went back to the place where he had prayed before the Lord and stood in the gap for Lot. Maybe he was going to pray some more. I'm not sure exactly what he was, what he was going to do or what he was doing there, but he stood in the place where he had prayed for Lot and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and behold and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. He goes to his place where he was praying and interceding on behalf of Lot. He looks out across the plain and he sees 
that God's judgment has been poured out because there's a smoke that's going up. The fire of God had consumed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. Verse 29 says, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Lot. That's not what this says. We need to destroy it. When He destroyed them, that God remembered the prayers of Lot. That's not what that says. It says when He destroyed them, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when He overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Hallelujah. How important is it today for you to stand in the gap and for your family? How important is it today for you to pray for this nation? How important was it for Lot that while he was down there in Sodom, how important was it for him that there was an old man out on the hillside saying, God, have mercy on my family. God, don't destroy it if you can find somebody righteous. How important is it today? If you read that, if you take into consideration, Brother Bruce, what we read in the book of Ezekiel, that God looked for somebody that was praying and couldn't find anybody. That look, God looked for somebody that was seeking His face for the land and couldn't find anybody. And because of that, He poured out His judgment. And then you look at this situation with Abraham and Lot, and you see because Abraham stood in the gap, because Abraham took the time to pray, because Abraham sought the face of God, Lot and his family was spared. Then ask yourself this question. How important is it that I stand in the gap for my family? Sister Teresa, how important is it that I pray for this nation? Amen? Oh, because God remembered Abraham, Lot was spared. God's looking with His mercy. He's looking to see if there's somebody standing in the gap. He's listening this morning to see if the remnant is calling out to Him. I made this statement last week, something along these lines, that it's time to rebuild the altar and return to the cross. It's time to rebuild the altar, not just in the church, but in our lives, in our homes, in this nation. Amen. It's time to call out on a living God, a holy God, a righteous God, and a merciful God who, who knows, might allow this nation one more chance if He can find somebody somewhere that's concerned enough to seek His face, that's concerned enough to pray to the God of heaven to have mercy on this land. One more example. Turn over to Exodus, the 32nd chapter. How important is it this morning that we pray for our loved ones? How important is it this morning that we stand in the gap for our loved ones, for this nation? We see another situation here. Exodus 32 and 30, and you know. You know the story. You've probably seen the movie. Moses went up onto the mountain to get God's Ten Commandments. And while he was up there, the people down at the down in the valley, the Israelites, decided on oh, Moses has been gone so long he's dead. They decided they needed another God. So they said, Give us all your jewelry, we'll throw them in here and we'll make something. So they threw the jewelry in there, they made them a golden calf, and they began to have a idol party. Moses comes down and finds them in that situation. It says in verse 30, in chapter 32 and verse 30, and it came to pass on the morrow. You see, Abraham knew, uh, uh, Moses knew that God's anger was kindled and that he was going to pour out his judgment on the people. What does verse 30 say? And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin. I'm through with you. I'm leaving. Pew. Let God do with you what He wants. I ain't going to think no more about you. I don't care what happens to you. That ain't what He said. Moses told the people, He said, You've sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. 
Listen what he says in verse 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, meaning if you'll forgive their sin, Lord, please forgive them. If not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Lord, if you're going to destroy them, destroy me with them. God looking for somebody to stand in the gap. God's looking for somebody that'll pray and ask God to forgive a people that have lost their way. Oh, you talking about a picture? This here put us to shame. The prayer that Moses prayed. He goes up there after the people have sinned greatly and he says, Lord, if you won't forgive them, if you can't have mercy on them, don't have mercy on me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people into the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall be before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I, will, when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. And if you go ahead and read the 33rd chapter, you'll find out how God judged and what He did. But instead of destroying them, He judged them in a different way. Why? Because Moses stood in the gap and prayed for the people. How important is it today that we stand in the gap for America? I think we're seeing this morning that it is of vital importance, that it's a matter between life and death. That it is a matter between having a space to repent and having God's judgment poured out and consuming the people. He talks about it again. I'm not going to go there because of time this morning, but in Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter, write that down. Moses reminds them again of the situation that it took place there in Exodus. But in Psalms 106 and 23, this puts it as clear as it can be. Therefore he said that he would destroy them. Talking about the children of Israel here in that situation in Exodus, the 32nd verse. Psalms 106 and 23 says, Therefore he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he would destroy them. We see plainly here, had it not been for Abraham, Lot would have been destroyed. Had it not been for Moses, Israel would have been destroyed. But because somebody cared enough, because somebody took the time, because somebody spent some time seeking the face of God on their behalf, God extended His merciful hand instead of pouring out His judgment. Do you see this this morning, church? How important is it for us to stand in the gap for this nation? How important is it this morning for us to stand in the gap for our family and for the lost? How important was it for Israel that Moses stand in the gap? How important was it for Lot that Abraham stand in the gap? I believe with all my heart this morning that in the, the chapter in Ezekiel that we read, and we know that it was talking about a particular people at a particular time, but I believe that we can look at that Scripture this morning and we can say without fear of contradicting the Word of God that we are in verse 30. And we already have seen what comes in verse 31. If God doesn't find somebody somewhere weeping, crying out to God to have mercy on a nation that is on a nation that has turned its back on God and turned to devils. If He doesn't find somebody standing in the gap for our loved ones that have walked away from God, if He doesn't find somebody in an old-fashioned altar of prayer crying out for mercy for God, verse 31 is coming. Verse 31 is coming. But I believe this morning the Spirit is telling us we are at verse 30. What happened between their wicked and their evilness and all of that? 
and God's judgment, there was a space that God's mercy looked. He knew. God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He knew that nobody was praying. But because of His mercy, He looked anyway. Because of His mercy, He listened for the voice of the remnant anyway. We're at verse 30. And let's not let it end the same way that verse 30 did there in the book of Ezekiel. Don't let, it be said, don't let it be said of God, I looked and I sought, but I found none. Oh, hallelujah. We can change the history of this nation. Hallelujah. In the direction that it's going this morning, if we'll find us an old-fashioned altar of repentance and cry out to God for mercy for the nation this morning. We can change the direction that our family members are going. How many people in here this morning have family members that if something don't change, they are going to go to hell? Amen. You can get in the way of that. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's not let verse 30 end in our life the way that it did with Ezekiel. But let God say that He looked, He sought, He listened, and He found. Amen. He found the remnant that was seeking His face. He found the remnant that had rebuilt the altar. He found the remnant that was crying out for mercy and pointing people to the cross. Hallelujah. He found the remnant that was standing between His judgment He found the remnant that was standing between His judgment and a wicked and ungodly people. He heard a voice in the midst coming up out of the crowd, coming up out of the waters that was crying out, God have mercy on this nation. God have mercy on my family. Hallelujah. We're at verse 30. But we can change the outcome of verse 31 if we'll spend some time seeking the face of God. How important is it? America's future depends upon it. How important is it? The future of the church depends upon it. Brother Jim, that revival we're always talking about depends upon this. Amen. Amen. How important is it for our family, for our kids, for our grandkids? How important is it for the lost? It's a matter of life and death. Eternal life. And eternal death. God's mercy is looking. He's listening to see if somebody is seeking His face. If somebody is standing in the gap. If somebody is praying for the nation, praying for their loved ones, how important was it for Lot? It was the most important thing. How important was it for Israel? It was the most important thing. How important is it today that we are found? That the, the voice of the remnant is heard coming up from the land, crying out on behalf of a people that have strayed and turned their back on God. The only thing that stood, I'm, I'm closing, I'm trying to. The only thing that stood between Lot and being consumed was the prayers of a little old man out on the hillside. The only thing that stood between Israel and being destroyed was the prayers of Moses. The only thing that stands between our nation, our family, our loved ones, lost souls this morning for being destroyed and suffering the judgment and eternal damnation of hell will be those that stand in the gap for them. 
That's how important it is, church. That's how important it is. Charles Spurgeon once said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, begging them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our prayers. And let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many will say, well, I'll pray if I have time. You better make time. Amen. Amen. Many will say, I'll pray if I feel led. <laughs> He's leading. The question is, are we following? How important is it today that we pray, that we stand in the gap? It is of utmost importance. I can't think of anything more important today. So many worry about making sure their family has the better things in life and nothing wrong with that. But they neglect to pray for their spiritual well-being. Don't let it be said this morning that God in the year of 2020, Brother Jim, sought for someone standing in the gap and found none. Let it be found. Let it be said that he sought and he found. He listened and he heard the voice of the remnant of God crying out for mercy on behalf of the land. If you have to leave this morning, that's all right. You can go on. We love you and appreciate you. I want to play a song and I want us to close with prayer this morning for this nation, for our family members. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's spend just a few minutes gather around the altar or pray in your seat. Like I said, if you have to leave, I understand that. Well, let's just pray this morning and ask the Lord. Ask God to have mercy.
teaches us and that's what the Spirit's saying to seek him while he may be found hallelujah <clears throat> anyone else <clears throat> have anything this morning before we go <clears throat> 